getting dirty, sipping on some scotch. We get a little wild, but it's sure fun to watch. We love what we do, we're drinking every brew. And we talk some shit, but we're telling the truth. Yeah, we're the scotchy bourbon boys. Raising some hell and making some noise. Yeah, we're the scotchy bourbon boys. We're here to have fun. All right, so we got everything going. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the live uh Facebook live, YouTube live with Nick Kalo, right? That's what it is. Kalo. Not Kalo, Kalo, right? <laughs> you, you sent me the pronunciation. I appreciate that because I am known for a lot of my screw ups. <laughs> really. <Yeah. am. laughs> so yeah, so welcome. Uh, I hope every and we also have CT here tonight. It's great to have you uh, with us. It's uh, so and and hopefully we're going to have you a little bit more coming up because uh, it looks you're ready to go now, right? Yeah, where the the bridal is off, basketball season is over. So let the fun begin. Yeah, this well. time. I mean, it just seems like this time of the year, even for like overall the the after the the holiday that January into like mid February, uh, it's uh, there's it's almost like there's a lull um, in how much bourbon's out there, how much stuff is getting done. I mean, it's winter time, cold. It keeps you, you know. So overall, I think now, now I don't know. Uh, Nick, where where are you right now? What what where are you? Is it what state? What, what you know? What's your location? He's in the Tar Heel <laughs> state. Yeah, yeah, I know it's the color of that shirt. At least it looks Tar Heel blue from here. Um, so <laughs> okay. I, I, yeah, look at that shirt. <laughs> um, I, so I'm right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, in a small town called Denver. Um, so we're Denver of the East. Uh, and today I think the high was 70 degrees. Nice. Now us in Ohio, which we're not, we are definitely not used to this type of weather in February. You got it right, Chris. We've been in the sixties yeah. last week. We're in the seventies. Yeah. We dropped down, but it's, it's really not been a cold winter. You know, that's yeah, one thing. It was humid today. Yeah, I mean, we had a little bit of rain. We didn't have a lot of rain. It was up here in Canton, and uh, uh, it, the whole day, you know, was sitting around the high, high 50s or the low 60s, which for February is crazy. Yeah, I think we've been uh, we've been a whole year without snow here, so it's, it's a little out of the ordinary for us. Well, if you say... Here's here's a unique thing. Last year uh, in March, we had a couple late February, early March here in Ohio. We had a couple pretty big snowstorms, probably the most dive uh, that, you know, you're we talking about a couple feet. The one and the other one was about 12, you know, 12 inches. And uh, I've been living here for about 18 years now, and I have never invested in a snowblower. I come originally <laughs> from Wisconsin, so I have a flat driveway, uh, and most of the time in Ohio, if it snows within a couple of days, it's melted or, you know, you can. So there hasn't been a lot of times where I've had it, but those cut times I had a shovel. So before that second one, it, my, it had my back had gone out and it started, it was going to, they were saying it was coming. So I ordered a snowblower. Well, the snowblower, it, the storm hit on Thursday and the snowblower was ready on Friday. So it really didn't do me much good. So I bought it. I picked it up the next week. I put it in my garage, but I never unpacked it. It never snowed again the rest of the year. It 
<laughs> then it sat unpacked, like in the box in my garage, all the way up until November. And we got a little dusting and I'm like, well, I better put this thing together. And I think I put it together in November, like on a 70 degree sunny day, use the electric starter, got it working, put gas in it. <laughs> and we have not had a reason to use a snowblower this year. So I've had a snowblower almost for a full year now. And I invested finally after 18 years, I invested in the snowblower and there's a chance I may never have to use it again, right? Global warming? Yeah, that's what they say. Chinese balloons, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what uh, What are they called? Contrails? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Changing the weather. Anyways, whatever. It's different. But uh, so, get, so get into, let's just real quick uh, cover that. The weather and distilling. Where you distill, how you distill, I mean, how does that how does that affect you? You know, um, well, it, definitely ambient temperature uh affects it. You know, you have hundreds of different yeast strains uh that you, you could use for your fermentation before you go into distilling. Uh one I use, you have to maintain anywhere from 65 to 90 degrees. Uh it has a fairly uh, moderate temperature range. Um, but in saying that, you know, we've had some cold spells here uh, to where I've had, you know, stalled fermentation. So good weather is always important. Um, you know, we, we, as moonshiners, we always have some kind of trick up our sleeve to keep it going through the winter time. Uh, uh, one of the things I use is the fish tank heater. Uh, you can set the temperature on it, drop it in your mash, uh, and it keeps your, keeps your mash it what temperature is supposed to be at. Okay. So you don't like double it as an actual fish tank heater, right? It's just... Oh, no, no. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, so, it could be my secret ingredient. I mean, I don't know. There you go. Just a little so, bit, right? That adds a little bit of a tang. A brine. A brine. <laughs> it just depends on what fish are in the tank, right? You that's could, right. Uh, yeah, you put some piranhas in there, and they, that's a certain that would do it. And you know, the fighting fish. You know, you got different. There's a there's a thing right there. Although that's just goofing around. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so so the yeast is the big thing. Once you just once once you have the fermentation and it's done, and you start distilling, the 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 still really isn't affected too much by weather. Or do you do you do you need more? uh energy you know more heat to, to keep it when it's cold out and you're and you're distilling well it it all depends on how thick your copper steel is or if you're your stainless steel if you're going that route um you know i but i got a pretty thick gauge copper on mine so like it normally holds the temperature pretty well um in my earlier versions of moonshining i had like 18 gauge copper and it was um like you had to have a pretty pretty warm environment, otherwise you're you're burning through more propane to try to keep it heat heated up, or uh, you're losing uh, vapor as it gets down to the before it gets to the condenser. So, okay. So you just start uh, after distilling for a while, and this is season you're distilling in. You kind of just kind of start to get to know what you got to do based off what's happening. But but it, at this okay. I was going to say, it, it's one of those things you definitely learn from trial and error experience. Um, you know, I, I started out, you know, making wands and meads and got to where I had so much product laying around. I had, you know, I needed to do something with this. So that's where I, I got started into making brandy. Um, and I bought like a little steal off of Amazon for a hundred bucks. And that's how I got my start. And then it's like, uh, becomes like a gateway drug and, uh, find you know bigger steels more parts hey nick do you do you vary what you make by the season do you like to is there certain kinds you like to make during you know different time of year i i i, I do grain mostly all year but there there are times like in seasonal that i do do uh different fruits uh you know strawberry seems gear area to come up i have a bunch of people who want strawberry lemonade or uh something like that um 
I have a lady I work with who has a vineyard, um, and she lets me pick muscadine. So muscadine brandy is always a big hit. All right. Uh, so uh, what did you? Let's just real quick for everybody. What you set me up a couple mason mini mason jars with labels. Are, are they the same or are they different? They they are both the same. Okay. Um, so I was uh, I didn't know if you want to share them or not, and it looks like you did not want to share them. Yeah, I, he I, did not. I did, did want not. to share, but but the way it went down and how how uh, Chris came on and everything, if we would have, uh, I would say if we would have done this next week, he would have had one of these. We haven't really seen. I mean, with his busy schedule and mine, what we were doing, we really haven't seen each other personally lately. But that's that will change this week. We're going to drink that tomorrow. Yeah, I'll bring it with us. No, I'm going to drink some of this tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're both the same. Um, so they are uh, an all corn, uh, all corn whiskey. Um, so a little bit of heirloom corn that I grow. Uh, it's a mix of Blue Hopi, Green Oxican, Bloody Butcher, Jimmy Red, it's popcorn. Uh, and then I use popcorn malt for it as well. Um, and with that fermentation process, I put peanut butter in it as well. So, I did, so I start with peanut butter from the beginning. Okay. Um, so here's a question. So you use popcorn corn. Yep. So it's, I really don't get like when the corn, you know, you got your your sweet corn, right? Where it's mm -hmm. edible, you cook it, and when you when you husk it, the the kernels have a lot of moisture in it and that type of thing. Where popcorn, do they dry that out to make the pop? Do they how what's the process of it ends up as a popcorn seed opposed to coming off the off the cob? I mean, I have no clue. How that works? I've never had any. Uh, you know, I made popcorn, and I understand what the popcorn. But compared to what would come off the the cob, it doesn't seem like that's just coming off the cob in a hard seed. It, it actually is. You can buy uh, there. There's some specialty shops where you can buy popcorn on the cob and literally pop it on the cob like that. So, uh, so that cob actually has hard the more hard it's a more hardened seed so when okay so when so then you're gonna put that in and cook it with the rest i mean when you're cooking that with the mash and it, you just cook it down and eventually it does the same thing yep so it'll it'll uh gel gelatinize uh which will start release so well let me, let me back up so you have to grind it down to almost like a uh either cracked corn or uh I grind mine down into like almost like a cornmeal, because uh, I, you know, I I use it for double uses. I'll use it for moonshine, but if I feel like making a cornbread, I can do that too. Uh, so uh, same thing for popcorn. So you you think of it like almost like a like a feed, like you're feeding livestock too. Like it when you, when you're getting it, it like it's hard grain too once you dry right. it out. And so uh, it's almost like a different variety of that. Okay, so do you when you do, like you said you grow your own corn? Yeah. Right. So what is the actual drying process? Is it just nature does it, or do you do something to the the kernels? Uh, I, I mean, I, I I'm clueless when it comes to I I've seen corn ground ground in the grinder, you know the the mill milled, and I've done that, but I've never understood how it got from just, you know, off the, you know, fresh off the, off the stock, you know, and then husked and then put into, you know, what is the process there? What do you got to do? Um, there, there are some, there are some, I guess, shortcuts. I call it cheating. Uh, like you can put it in a dehydrator if you want to. Uh, but I like to think of it like barrel aging, like nothing beats Tom. So really I, you know, I tie them to strings and I and I hang them up and I just let uh, let time do its thing. Like they'll eventually dry out. Um, you know, it's not one of those things where you just want to sit it like on a table or something because it you know it it molds that way for some reason. But if you just suspend it in the air, uh, they eventually dry out. Almost kind of like what you would do with tobacco. 
do you like do you keep it when you're suspending it do you, are you like keeping it on the stock and just keeping it up there or, or is that kind of like i mean when you buy the stocks you know right out and you put it in your front yard as decoration eventually the squirrel grabs the <laughs> and runs off with them you know kind of thing and that's how so that's kind of how you dry it out we just hang it up hang it like that and then a cool draw spot so i like you know once again my wife like she's the same for let me do the things i do uh but i but i hang them up around the house you know where you know i know they can get some cool temperature uh you know keep the fan going uh keep it from getting too humid in summer and all right well that's that that's got to be interesting right having people over and it's just kind of it adds a uh what you know outside uh, in the inside right oh yeah like pe people thought i was a witch for the longest time i'm hanging corn around the house and you know i think i have some kind of spell going on yeah you're burning sage and <laughs> <laughs> hey right. tiny the, show that uh the bottle again that picture that he puts on the bottle the that's it's really cool the uh i, I noticed nick you have a cup that you guys did that gray cup that has like a swirl to it that was on your Facebook page. That was really cool. Yeah. Uh, Michaela Haynes, uh, she lives in Tennessee. Uh, she does like all, like all my products like that. And she actually hand paints and epoxy those one by one. So yeah, like, I think I got cool. like 50 to 60 of them in stock. Like she puts a lot of time and effort into that. Yeah. That's cool. That's a labor of love, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh funny story about that picture so like the the avatar or the what uh what do you call that the artificial intelligence avatar thing started coming out uh and i was like it was like three dollars and they give you like 75 different samples so i ran a few pictures through it and what that's one of the ones that came out uh and i was like man that, that looks pretty sharp and i just kind of ran with it yeah, yeah that's yeah. good it's good <laughs> yeah well i think um especially like uh the what is it the white lightning uh your mash paddle mash paddle which i really liked uh, i i mean i i use um what would you say i use iMovie also to do a lot of editing so i recognized how <laughs> it was done and what but it was done it was done very well so i kind of was using that uh this week to promote us going live you know so that was i i, I think you you've done a really good job as far as uh marketing i i enjoyed it's kind of i'm the kind of guy that loves the full package you know now i love when it comes to moonshining the package is way different than bourbon i mean when you're talking about high end i i like bookers i like the box I like the taste. I like the backstory. And then moonshining, you have a certain amount of um, when when you apply all that to the to the moonshining thing, there's a little bit of a commercial thing that happens. But then you want some of the down home. Uh, what would you say? Connection of, you know, I, I feel that moonshining's uh, one step it's raw closer to you know uh nature put it that way it's it's the way things had been done for a, a long long time and uh what would you say the definition of moonshining isn't to ma to make it so mass produced that everybody's getting it it's more uh heritage it's and tradition well and heritage it's the person that's doing it you know and their love for doing that you know and i really think that's that's a cool part of moonshining hey, I, it, oh go ahead no go finish and i'll say go ahead i, I was gary to say yeah like you hit you hit the nail on the head with that it's not uh it's not something i'm in to do to become a millionaire because i you know i i know it's not it's not a realistic goal with that you know i I enjoy doing what I do uh, and just like sending you those samples. Like, you know, I enjoy hearing what people giving me feedback on, on what I make. You know, I, a lot of times I'll lose money on, you know, me putting into it. Uh, you know, especially with the cost of, you know, ingredients it is today. Uh, but I, you know, I just love doing it. Like, you know, I just can't get enough of it. 
Now, did I rewrite that your grandfather used to distill? Is that he did. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where I sell, you know, I was self taught, uh, you know, different uh, Facebook groups. But when I found out, by the time I found out he had done moonshine, like he'd already passed. So mm -hmm. I didn't get to really pick up that knowledge, you know, from him that. You know, he did uh, back when he was in West West Virginia. Pretty cool, though, that you picked up something out of the blue and then it relates back to your grandfather and you didn't even know it. Well, it, and I didn't really know it until uh, like, you know, I was looking at I was looking at going on the show and, you know, I wanted to get all my facts in line. So, I, you know, I started tracing it back because, I, I, you know, I remember him talking about moonshine, but never really like knowing he was, he was a part of it. Uh, and I started talking to some family, you know, some distant family in West Virginia and Virginia that we have. Uh, and then they kind of filled it, filled in the rest for me. Very cool. That's cool. So I think that's good. Uh, we did a good uh, live pregame there. So we're going to get ready to start uh, the actual uh, audio podcast. So I'm going to hit that. We're going to be quiet for 30 seconds. Uh, I want to say real quick that uh, Sean Rigby says hi to us and what's happening. And then Jason Sparkman is watching along with uh, Jason Hayes. So they've been, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> We got some stuff going on in the in the. Uh, we actually have a, a a barrel pick group that uh, we talk a lot with. So, what what the heck just happened? Oh, we're going sideways. Hey, I gotta. I'll be right back. I gotta plug my phone in. Oh, okay, that's no problem. Uh, so, well, we'll just wait till he gets back. Then we'll hit the start recording for the the podcast. But the but that room. It's we do we go around and do barrel picks all around everywhere and uh then through that group that's a Facebook chat that we have people uh you know that I just basically changed the name of the pick <laughs> and everybody's <laughs> in there. So it's pretty wild. We got some wild people in there, there's no doubt about it. Because a lot of times the master distillers in there from other picks and then on the current one. So it, it really gets, we can get wild <laughs> <laughs> and it happens at all times of night and morning. <laughs> I can, I can understand that. They're distillers, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we're all a, like a different breed, you know, uh, you know, we, uh, if you put us all in a room together, you know, you ask someone what we all had in common, People would say, you know, probably nothing. But uh, usually, what the what's in common is your dedication to working your ass off, and also your passion for what you do. And it seems like that theme runs consistently. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a that's why I like y'all. <laughs> Someone, you know, there's a couple times where people mentioned maybe that I would. Uh, maybe come work at a distillery or I would, you know, put some time in. And I love the podcast aspect so much because like, like anything else I moved from, I, when I lived in Wisconsin, I would come visit my grandparents here in Canton. And when I came probably every two, three times, I go to the pro football hall of fame. And then I moved here 18 years ago and I've been there twice. <laughs> so you, you could take them, take, them your, take, a, take your snowblower over and maybe they can use it. Yeah, that's about how, how it would work. So it's like anything else. You, you know, if you start to, uh, you know, if you start to, you know, what would you say? Uh, concentrate on one particular distillery, you're not going to get to go out and do too much for all the other ones. Or you get in that group and there's so many good groups that this is, uh, I just love doing this. That's why meeting people like you, Nick. So it's it's a lot of fun. And then, then down the road, if we're in the area, you know, stop by, see you, talk, you know, share some, share some good alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've actually been uh, developing something new that uh, nobody's got on the shelf yet, and I, and I hope they don't steal this idea from this podcast, but uh, 
you know, I, I have a movie theater that I, I have a good relationship with and they give me the popcorn they don't sell at the end of the night. Uh, so I've been using that to kind of come up with like a kettle corn flavor. Uh, and so far I've, I've had good results with it. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get it going. I'm going to hit this. We'll be quiet. And thank you everybody on Facebook live and YouTube live for the pre the pre uh, podcast. And we'll get started with the main one. Here we go. Hey, Scotchy Bourbon Boys fans, this is Alan Bishop, Indiana's alchemist of the Black Forest. So I'm tuning in here today to tell you all about the One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute channel on YouTube. If you're at all interested in the art of distilling, whether it be home distilling or professional distilling, and the intense geekery that goes into that process, then check out the One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute on YouTube. I promise you're going to learn something you didn't know before about the arts. This is Alan Bishop, head alchemist at Spirits of French Lick. Be on the lookout for our brand new Bottled and Bond Solomon Scott Rye Whiskey. Made from a mash composed of 65% rye, 35% corn, and 5% victory malt. This five-year-old 100-proof rye whiskey is a throwback to early 1800s style rye whiskeys of the Ohio Valley. Named after the legendary Daisy Spring Mill distillery owner turned moonshiner Solomon Scott of Paoli, Indiana. Remember, drink responsibly and never drink and drive. Welcome to another podcast of the Scotchy Bourbon Boys. I'm Tiny. We got a great podcast a ahead. We have Nick Kalo. Uh, he was the winner, correct, of M Moonshiner's Master Distiller. Uh, not the, not just the last one, but the 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 what would you call series before, right? It was yeah. So it aired actually December fourteenth. So, uh, and then also we have CT here tonight, or and we'll just have to decide in if he's going to be the coach or is going to be CT. We just don't know yet. Just whatever. Just exactly. Whatever. You go with that all the time. The you guy. Just, the I guy. Mean, <laughs> the guy. The guy in the corner. <laughs> no, not that guy. No. Not the other guy. Yeah. It's like uh, not the guy that's going to cause the ballroom blitz, right? Not right. that guy. <laughs> All right, so uh, we uh, having having Nick. Uh, we were talking a little bit before about a bunch of stuff uh, beforehand, but uh, really, what I wanted to get into uh, is straight up. What what is it? Uh, what's it like? What was it like to actually be on? You know, master dis master distill moonshiners master distiller i mean the experience you know is one thing and you get to meet them and you know they've they've uh what would you say they've taken uh moonshine and uh presented it in a way where a lot of people uh it changed a lot of people in what what was happening correct i mean oh, that's yeah. what the show did but with the master distiller 
uh, it's kind of even a you know another cooler thing because I I know so many people now that have been on the show and it's just like um, they are uh, I know Kelly uh, who we're friends with who just won she won the last particular uh, series and or season and then she's you know now she's uh, what is it she's taking a job at whiskey thief distillery so there's so many different paths to go once you're on there correct oh and yeah absolutely it, op it definitely opens up the door so what's what's the path that you're on you know what i mean that's what we're looking for tonight right we want to find out what's the path you know you you've done that you've been doing this you know where where are you going from from there well i you know the, to answer your first question, uh, to be on there, I mean, such a huge honor. I mean, it just, I, I feel like I was starstruck up until the last bit of filming where I finally started getting comfortable. Um, you know, and, and, and during the whole interview process, I actually thought it was like a police sting. Uh, like they were, they were getting ready to bust me. They're trying to set me up to meet them somewhere, and uh, they're going to throw me in the back of a car. Um, so up until the week before I was kind of weary about everything. And then, um, yeah, I got there and just total starstruck. I mean, these guys, I, you know, I seem as like the gods of moonshine, like, you know, like you said, they've taken like a backwoods art, uh, and they brought it into the limelight, you know, today's moonshine would not be what it is without them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the path that you know, you, know, when it, you said they've taken like a backwoods of wait, art. Oh, that's um, my fault. Sorry, <laughs> I flipped over to the Facebook and it was it was I had still had the sound up. All right, go ahead. The path. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, when in the episode that I was on, um, you know, I, I really didn't know what to expect and you know what to expect since. Uh, but uh, it, you know eventually you know i would like to own my own distillery one day um uh, but uh since the show i've actually partnered up with uh with the distillery in my area uh they put out some awesome uh moonshine and uh some craft whiskeys uh south mountain distilling um uh, and we're in the beginning of the stages of hopefully put uh the product that you're tasting right now um uh, on the shelf good for you that's that's excellent so that's the kind of door that it it opens uh to some, now were you were you did you have that connection pretty much and we're thinking beforehand you know or did, was it a direct a relation to going on the show well you know i first i actually first heard about south mountain distilling uh while we were up there filming uh you know we uh we stopped in at this uh place called adventure distilling company uh, went in and looked and they had, um, all these different flavors of pecan pie and, uh, cinnamon and, uh, pineapple upside down cake. Uh, and I was like, God, this place is awesome. man. <clears throat> they're actually a sister, uh, distillery of South mountain distilling. Uh, so they actually should sell both there. And that, that's how I actually found them. But, uh, when I won, I, I was, I was not anticipating going legal. Um, uh, it just wasn't in the plan. You know, I knew that I was going to get a limited run with Sugarlands Distilling as part of my, my winner's package, um, but never anticipated that another distillery would want to pick me up. Yeah, that's, that's, that is excellent that, you know, how you describe that. Now, as far as the, the, you just said it, what, what was the winner's package? Let's, let's go to that. I mean, you, you know, you, you did it and one and there's some there's but they're you know it's great you get the honor of winning but then you know go over the actual package so um for those of you who haven't seen the show before um they get uh three distillers whether it's uh they're all moonshiners backwoods distillers no professional experience or they throw in some uh professional distillers in there uh and the three are competing uh against each other for a, a limited run at Sugarlands Distillery, um, where they'll take you know your winning liquor and they'll produce it at Sugarlands at their uh, Gatlinburg Distillery for a limited time. 
That's okay. And then uh, do they sell that at the distillery there? That's that's kind of like that's the whole purpose. They got the brand then on the shelf there for that run. Right. Correct. So it'll be like a Gatlinburg exclusive uh, okay. for when they do put it out. Okay. So have you done the run? Uh, I have not. We are act. Uh, well, I, I say we. I said uh, Sugarlands is actually behind uh, two to two to three seasons right now. So, and I can understand that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the world went to shit there for a while, right? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it put everybody behind. You know, so yeah. yeah hey, Nick, some, so, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so since the show and obviously the exposure that you've gotten from it, so are you getting contacted by any distilleries uh, that want you to to be involved with them? Because, I mean, I would think if I owned a distillery um, and I and you're always looking for good distillers who know their craft, you know, obviously, you know it very well. Do, do you do you hear from these people or is that something you think that'll come down the pipe? Well, I've. I've heard from heard from a few, uh, and I and I actually interviewed for some head distiller positions, and uh, you know the big thing is scale. Is that you know they they want someone with experience running on a seven hundred and fifty gallon, you know, all steam pot, and you know I I run on a twenty gallon, you know, electric submarine pot, you know, so you know they're I, I think they're a little bit weary as to. Uh, can I can I mass produce what I do, like on a small scale? Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, the the future is always open for that. You know, I'm always open to new uh, opportunities with that, and uh, you know, I hope this partnership with South Mountain Distilling leads somewhere. Uh, if not, you know, you know, build a better relationship with them. Mm -hmm. We had. Uh... Pappy G, which is George Rose, on a couple last, I think it was probably last Tuesday. And uh, he talked the same. So he had done some moonshining at Neely. Uh, and he basically put out his grandpa's recipe. It's called. Uh, uh, Poppy's. Yeah. Uh, Poppy. Oh, wait. Pop Casey's. It's a. Uh, nine grain it's old 50 old 51 old third old kentucky 31 nine grain moonshine so he used nine grains to make the moonshine but he talked the same thing what you're talking about when he got there and you're doing a 600 gallon still opposed to like what you're doing a 20 gallon still and you're doing the math <laughs> to get your mash into that 600 he said that was part of the whole thing of what was the hard part of uh you know you know and then you know if you fuck up a 20 gallon run it's it's not like it's it's a good thing and it's not like you know but if you start over if you have if you had to start over because something happened or whatever but when when you're doing 600 gallons and you mash it and you get it in and you ferment it and you're just you get it into the state you got it i mean he said that there's a certain aspect of pressure but from everybody i've ever talked to that's done you know alan bishop he's he he got hired at uh i believe it's copper and keys and they did the same thing they're like here's the still do it and he looked at it, the guy that he was distilling with and whatever and they came from home distilling and now they've got this large giant pot still and he said you know he's ordering the grain you know getting the, the stuff he wants and he's just thinking all along that it's it, you know the grain that's the corn and the wheat and the rye and the malt malted barley you need to run a 600 gallon or a 750 gallon still there's a hell of a lot of grain <laughs> you know you get a lot of work and time that if that run goes bad and then you have the people that you're working for so he said he felt the same you know he talked about it that he felt that same kind of pressure to some extent but at the same time 
the only way you're ever going to do it is to do it. You know, that's one thing. Uh, it's the only way you're ever going to home distill moonshine is to do it, right? You you took that Absolutely. step and decided to do it. It's a big step, but it's the same thing as you go along the process. I think that is very similar. I, well, it, 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 and you, you got to go back to like hundreds of years ago, like everybody had to start somewhere. Like, you know, there, there's some distilleries that's been passed down from generation to generation, but there are those who, you know, who started in the backwoods moonshine. And uh, Tim Smith is a perfect example of that with his Climax moonshine. Like, you know, he started backwoods, uh, got on the show, like went legal like he said he would. And I think he's in uh, I th pretty much every state in the U.S. with it. So uh, it, for me, it's all about legacy. Uh, I want to leave something behind for my daughter that she can be proud of, that she can carry on if she decides to. Um, and I hope uh, this peanut butter banana is going to be the ticket. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so let's uh, talk about the when you when it comes to moonshine. Now, moonshiners can have no problem making whiskey. It just you you basically are using your grain mash bills or or whatnot. But it, it uh, but because you're a moonshiner, you're not really held to the rules of whiskey. So there's a like you said in the one you add in the peanut butter. It's like you're not adding in peanut butter when you're making whiskey, unless you're going to try and make peanut butter flavored whiskey, correct? Right. And and, and most actual peanut butter flavored whiskeys uh, are flavored after the fact. Right. Uh, so uh, when I when I started, I started out doing craft whiskeys, you know, uh, you know, rapid aging to uh, uh, thermocycling, uh, different ways to kind of replicate that barrel, that barrel taste. Uh, and I actually got fairly good at a maple vanilla whiskey that I'm super proud of. Um, but then, then I started thinking long-term, uh, like, you know, do I really want to go into like the expensive whiskey market? There are so many out there. Uh, and so many that, you know, just have this legacy behind them. Uh, whereas like a newcomer, am I ready to step up into the big boys game? And uh, that's where I feel like, you know, I started experimenting with different things with brandies and uh, moonshine. And uh, I just feel like moonshine, there's just such, there's such potential there for it to really grow. Well, one of the things, uh, when you talk to you know moonshine people who moonshine and home distilled, there's the there's an aspect of going into the commercial whiskey making industry where you're gonna where I really feel and uh, that and have been taught that when you ferment in a natural environment and when you 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 know the kind of water that you can use like if you're if you if you're set up next to a stream and you're pulling you know the water out of the creek you know that type of thing it, it all comes down to how close you are to nature and there's a certain aspect of whiskey distilling or moonshining that nature completely t takes a part in and uh, i think if you're taught how to do this through schooling to go into the commercial, you're skipping a lot of that understanding uh, and respect there is to, to, you know, the yeast you're using or how you capture your yeast and what, you know, some people use dry yeast, some people use like, some people do now. I mean, I had no idea up until last year, there's a thing where you just do the, where you just put everything in there and to ferment, you cook it and you put it out there. And you just wait. <laughs> it, it can take up to a month or two months. And you're just waiting for the natural yeast in the area to take hold. And sometimes it wouldn't. I mean, uh, there was some fermenting, you know, the first uh, fermentation after the 
the pilgrims ar- arrived at Plymouth Rock, they they brought a still and they their fermentation was natural and it didn't take hold for eight months. <laughs> After eight months, it finally took hold. And then then they, the second one, they were able to do it and produce something that was drinkable. <laughs> well, and you got to look at it, too, that, you know, Vikings, you know, uh, honey meat was always their big deal. Uh, you think back, like, how they discovered that, you know, <laughs> honey and a little bit of water and then just leave it there and it, it ferments into something that's going to get you crazy drunk. Um, you know, it, it's crazy how we developed as, you know, I'm getting a little uh, deep here, but as humans, when it comes to distilling and the different tricks of the trade, uh, I do feel like as moonshiners who have the home distilling aspect of it, try to stick to as traditional as possible. Uh, whereas if you go to school for it, you know, and you got a, you know, a degree in food chemistry or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, the scientific part of it, uh, like you were saying, uh, but you're, you know, I, I feel like you need a little bit of both, uh, really master it. Uh, it's a, it's an even balance on that. I, I feel it's almost like the medical field. There's, there's a lot of natural medicine, natural supplements and herbs that somebody who does that, that holistic, holistic part of it, but then there's the part of the modern medicine and the medical part of it. But if you can combine the two is where the answer usually is, unless, you know, you're talking about catastrophic stuff that nobody knows what's going on. But at the same time, you know, my wife is a midwife at home birth midwife, but she also learned a lot from doctors by being a, initially she was a doula in the hospital and she learned a you know, a lot of medical stuff. That's just how her brain works. And then when she became a home birth midwife, she could apply both. She applies both parts to her practice. I mean, if things start to get to a point where you need medical attention, you got to go get medical attention, but uh, you know, it's a natural thing. And it's the same thing. Like what you're saying is that if you have both, the best thing would be is somebody who's trained both ways and then, then develops the best of both worlds. Absolutely. I, mean, I I've you know I've heard so much and about the modern day distillery. And it's not the same as just let's just say some of the older distilleries that are running. Though, you know, some of the big guys at the old distilleries have the modern day te- technology, but you take like a place like Bardstown Bourbon Company where it's all been installed initially and set up to work, you know, and you have complete control. And yes, the control that you have there is very modern, you know, but if you understand how it was done in the old days and what you're trying to achieve using the modern technology, you really can make some damn good artists. You can be, you can really be an artist on that machinery, but if you've never run it and all you know is the computer aspect of it, you're not really looking for things that you couldn't obtain when during the old process you know and then there's certain things that you did in the old process that you want to keep doing because they were delicious you know it's the same thing uh i think you you mentioned something that's been the biggest and best thing and i'm it's even though people will say that this is not the overall for society it's it's like you hear people talk about but you mentioned amazon <laughs> And I've I've talked to a couple of distillers and, you know, where did you get that ginger? And they're like, believe it or not, uh-huh. the best place to get the ginger is Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before you couldn't get ginger. You know what I mean? All of a sudden now on Amazon as a home distiller, you go and you need what you want. You put it there and it shows up at your doorstep two days later. Right. I mean, that's just- oh, I mean, that, that maple vanilla whiskey I was talking about. Uh you know, you know, the maple syrup I used was actually a bar- barrel aged maple syrup, and I used real vanilla bean. Both came from Amazon. Like, where, you know, where am I going to find barrel aged maple syrup in North Carolina? Like, it's just not, you know, it's just not feasible. Yeah. Or, you know, you did it because you met the barrel aged maple syrup producer, you know. Yeah, I know. I completely uh, know exactly what you're talking about as far as that goes. It was like, 
you would never think that's what, but I really believe that Amazon has helped home distilling. I mean, even the parts for your still. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually ordering a sight glass uh, for my still now from Amazon. You know, it, it, it's just, yeah, it, Whereas, it definitely opens up this door to things that you couldn't get at Walmart or Target or something like that. Is the still behind you, Nick, the one you use? It is. Um, so, let's see, feel of it, but it's a little. Uh, this is actually a ten-gallon submarine that I use, and then I have another twenty-gallon I have as well. Uh, but this one's all electric. So, and, and that's another key part that you were talking about with modern technology, uh, where I was using. You know, a lot of people use propane, and they still use it to this day. Uh, you know, I almost blew up a steel using propane, and uh, I switched to electric. Uh, that's one of those trial and error things and you learn, uh, you know, sacrificing, you know, faster heat for a safer, safer route. So, so where in your house are you? <laughs> uh, so I'm in, uh, we were just talking about this in the beginning. Uh, what would be my dining room? Uh, we're currently under, uh, renovations. You, you uh, repurposed your dining room too. Yeah. <laughs> so you're telling me that you do runs in your dining room? Um, I actually do runs in my living room. I break out <laughs> I, I break out a folding table and uh like spread it out. Cause I, you know, I do the full thing. I use a thumper, two mason jars, uh, depending on what I'm doing, uh, to really get, add some complexity into what I'm doing. All right. So let's talk about this. You sent me these samples. I'm going to keep this sample for Chris tomorrow. You can have some of that tomorrow. We'll split that. But talk about. You said what, I could have it. Now we got to split it with you. You can <laughs> have it tomorrow. I, I guarantee you, we will be drinking enough where I probably should stay the F away from this. Yes. <laughs> so give me, give me proof. But, you know, and it's kind of like cool. You just shake it up and you can kind of see the bubbles and. Just give me what the proof is and then also what went into making this because uh, it's it's really uh, different than what I'm normally used to when it comes to moonshine. Well, it's uh, well, it's it's 80 proof. Like uh, when I when I first started the moonshine game, my goal was to get the highest proof I can with the most flavor. Uh, but if you ever had high proof alcohol, you know that there's there's really no flavor in it. It's because the alcohol kills all that. Um, so through my years of distilling, I've, I've learned that, you know, you sacrifice your proof to get better flavor. Uh, I feel like 80 is a good mark for that uh, with that peanut butter banana. What, well, also what people don't understand now, what so what was the mash for this? You said it was corn. Yep. So. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I use corn, uh, corn I grew, heirloom corn, uh, different varieties. You know, I I grow like two to, well, about w one to two rows of each different variety. So uh, I kind of just mix everything together because there's not enough there to stand on its own to do its own. Uh, and for... Sugar content, uh, I actually have some honeybees on my property. Um, so I use a little sugar to balance out the rest of the, um, to bring up the ABV to where it needed to be. I always try to go all grain if I can. So um, was honey? Honey. Honey was the sugar content. Actually, when I was when I was drinking this, I was thinking that it's got, there's a peanut butter honey flavor to it. I actually... So that's that's really kind of cool that you you used. Uh, I was gonna say it's got a mead quality to it. Yeah, I I I, I agree with you on that. Um, you know, when I do my moonshine, I always try to be as self sufficient as I can. Uh, you know, the challenge that I had for the show was thirty dollars to put twenty gallons of mash together, but anything you grew or forage counted as free. Uh, so I, I feel like it was a perfect challenge for me because I you know. I always try to keep my costs low um, so that, you know, I'm not overcharging people for, you know, a jar of alcohol that I enjoy doing. But um, 
So, so, uh, so to keep your costs low, you grow your own corn and you have a honeybee farm on your property. I wouldn't say a farm. I have like a hive. <laughs> okay. So you you make your own, you get your own honey. So I, I don't know. From my standpoint, I think that that should be really expensive, not to you, <laughs> <laughs> to other people, it's your own homegrown and either and your own uh, cult cultivated honey. I mean, we're you know that's not something that everybody does all all the time. I mean, a lot of distillers grow their own corn and their own corn strain. You know, there's no doubt about it. But there's not a lot that are beekeepers. No, no, and and really, I I wouldn't even call myself a beekeeper. Right? You know, we long story short, we bought this house from my father in law. Um, and he left the bees here and we kind of just, uh, so he was a beekeeper. He was the beekeeper. He actually has more than one hive. Uh, but he, he left the hive here and, uh, we kind of just borrowed from it. So, and, and if you ever needed more, is he still a beekeeper? He still is. Um, I'm sure he would, uh, be willing to, to give up for it. So he's not a drinker, but uh, I think he would help us out if we, uh, just so you know, I know a woman that collects bourbon and she's got this amazing collection but she doesn't drink it's just uh and then uh michelle who she, her husband drinks and i see her in line all the time she waits in line for bourbon loves to get the bourbon loves the chase but she's not a drinker <laughs> so well, i have a lady that buys it from me uh who, who uses it to make her own cough syrup she doesn't drink but she uses it to make medicine so, well, there you go. See, it takes all kinds, right? Yep. Um, I think Nick, so Nick, you are definitely uh, the uh, definition of farm to table, being that the table is in your living room, and, I <laughs> and, <use you're>, it. <laughs> and you're and you're you're growing everything outside your house. It's pretty pretty amazing. So, yeah, I I mean, it's just I and I think that's how you keep. Um, control of your quality too you know it's oh when you're on a mass scale you know commercially like you, you just can't do that like there's just no time to you know grow your own stuff process it yourself like it's just uh on a smaller scale though you know it's it, it I, I feel like it makes a difference like i've done store-bought corn versus what i've grew and it's just it's a night and day difference yeah i have a friend who's a chef and he owns a restaurant and he grows all his as much of his produce as he can, you know, his tomatoes, his peppers, and he has them right there because it's the same reason he wants to know what he's getting is what he's getting and not, you know, variant depending on what store got it. Absolutely. Well, and even when I do, when I do seasonal stuff, uh, whether it's uh, strawberry or peach or muscadon, uh, I go to locally sourced places where I know where it's coming from and what they use. So, you know, I always try to do quality control as best I can. So I think I've got one of your relatives. Do you know Vinny? Halo? Vinny? Vinny? Yeah, Vinny. No, no, not unless it's a distant relative. I don't know yet. Wow. So wait, let me see. Is that it? It looks it, Vinny Kalo. Okay. So he says he says hi. I mean, there's to us, but you know, he had an idea that would that's a, even more illegal. He said, put some weed in the doubler. So <laughs> there you go. It came from I, Vinny. I actually one of the distilleries I met with uh before I partnered with South Mountain, uh, they are actually producing uh like a hemp vodka. Uh that's gonna be hitting the shelf soon. Um so I, I thought that was super fascinating. Yeah, it's just like if you uh, are are using uh, cannabis for distilling, is once it's distilled, is it no longer cannabis? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you could see it kind of like edibles, like you're you're drinking it instead of eating it. So right, it's uh, what would you that that's an alchemy thing, right? Yeah. There you go. So um, yeah, evaporate the what it THC and then re you know recondense it back into alcohol. There you go. Alcohol that would be interesting if you had that in. I think I would mix it in with the wheat with you know so nobody knew. 
Yeah, instead of calling it the devil's lettuce, you uh, call it the devil's nectar. You know. There you go. All right, so so you got the corn. So go on with the mash and, uh, you know, how, how, you know, and the honey, you know, go on what, you, what the process is for making this particular moonshine. Well, uh, you know, without giving away too much of the recipe, uh, one of the key features that I use, and they use it in a lot of peanut butter beers, is powdered peanut butter. Uh, when I first started this uh, this recipe and trying to get it, you know, I'd go to Sam's and buy the huge tubs of peanut butter and dumping it in there. Uh, and it uh, it would leave a huge layer of oil on top of it, almost like when you get natural peanut butter. And I'd have to siphon it off. It'd be a huge pain in the ass. Uh, but with the powdered peanut butter, it doesn't do that. So you're kind of cutting out that step. Um, yeah. You're cutting out so, the oil. Yeah. So dehydrated peanuts, is, you know. The power of suggestion <laughs> is insane. Because, you know, I, I tried this initially. I definitely got the honey, but I wasn't able to get, you know, I wasn't pulling the peanut butter. Now that I'm drinking it, it just comes right out. Straight, straight slap you in the face. And, it, you know, it's when your palate is, everybody always says, well, the power of suggestion it's not really the power of suggestion. It's the power of education. So if someone like yourself, you know the peanut butter's in there, you know the honey, and you're telling, you're not telling me what I should taste, you're telling me what you used. And then it allows me to recognize recognize the taste. Um, just like tasting or you know, whiskey blind or tasting food blind. You know, there's a lot of times you taste food, you think you know what the taste is, but you taste it blind. You, you have a preconceived notion when you see it and you know what you're eating. So you, you, you're me, you have memory of what that should taste like. And then when you eat it, your mind combines the taste with the memory to produce the overall desired effect. Uh, and I'll give you an example because of COVID I had everything reset and there's so much that I used to like, that I don't like anymore. Uh, for instance, yeah. French fries, corn chips. There are things that I used to eat, and I know what they're supposed to taste like based off of eating them as a kid and everything. But now, when I eat a French fry, I taste the oil. You know, I'm tasting a ton of the oil. It's almost like a... a and it's funny because I keep eating, I kept eating French fries up until recently because I thought French fries should taste good. But after, you know, another, it's been a year after probably about 50 more servings of French fries and the taste <laughs> is still oil, I'm like, I really don't like this. So I should stop. And it's the same thing. When you told me what was in it, now I can recognize that that flavor. But without knowing that flavor in there, I couldn't come up with what it was because you just, you know, blind, you just don't know. It's in there and I could taste it, but I couldn't tell you what it was. So I think that was really, you know, a cool thing. Well, it, it, and I want up you on examples is uh, watermelon candy. Uh, like, I feel like it's a, like the biggest lie when it comes to how watermelon actually tastes. Uh, <laughs> Like you, you go eat a watermelon Jolly Rancher and then you turn around and eat a fresh watermelon. It's not the same, but uh, the food close. market these days, like makes you, tells you that that's what watermelon tastes like. Hey, Nick, have you ever drank a high noon watermelon? No, I have not. Okay. So the high noon drinks, they have a watermelon. It tastes absolutely like the rind of the watermelon, not the good part. Yeah. Well, the, the guy I was on the show with, Devon, he did, uh, like his spirit he was doing was a watermelon moonshine. And it, I, he used fresh watermelon in a slurry uh, and, and macerated it before he distilled it. And it came out tasting just like a Jolly Rancher. Like, I've never, I, I was so surprised that, because I hate fresh watermelon. And I probably would have drank that whole jar if you'd have let me. Well, uh, I, you condense those sugars. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and, uh, and for, everybody out there i mean the one of the main difference 
differences between moonshine and whiskey is the sugar. Some people use actual just cane grain sugar, you know, and, and that allows when you're putting it in, in your mash, it basically is the ultimate food for yeast. It's the right um, molecules for breaking down. When you're making uh, whiskey and you're using the grains for, you know, you're using rye and you're using wheat and you're using corn, you've got to actually add the barley or enzymes to break those sugar chains where the sugar that you're adding, you know, is the that that chain's already ready to be processed from uh, from into, you know, from sugar into alcohol by the yeast. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny, but like you now, if you take that off at 180 proof, you're not going to taste a lot of the sugar, right? So what you're <laughs> saying is, is you like to, what, what, what is the, what's it coming off the still for you when you're, when you're distilling? So when that comes off the still, um, you know, after, you know, after I ditch my four shots in my heads, uh, I sit at around 160 to 150 for majority of the hearts. Uh, and then it'll just, it'll tank down through the tails pretty, pretty quickly after that. Um, but yeah, uh, the rest of it's just tempering it down. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I back flavor with a little bit more, uh, you know, well, backing up a little bit. Uh, I throw I throw some banana and stuff in the in the thumper with it too uh, to help get that peanut butter banana taste. Uh, and you only get like a hint of the banana in it. The peanut butter so strong that you just get a tiny bit of banana at the end. Um, but with that though, uh, now where do you get the banana? On the this, banana? right? So, it's yeah. on the nose. Yeah, like what's left in this glass. I, I can smell the banana, whereas on the taste, it's the peanut butter and the honey. Yeah. So banana is one of those hard flavors to really pull over. Uh, and it's and banana brandy is like a moonshine. It's supposed to be a moonshiner's bread and butter. Like every, you know, when you do moonshine, everybody wants to start off with banana brandy. Uh, but then a lot of people get discouraged or disappointed with it because that banana flavor doesn't carry over. Uh, like you think it should, you know, not not every flavor that you're going to throw into a thumper or the pot uh, is going to carry over like you think it would. And, and like you were saying, uh, things change, molecules change, and uh, it changes that flavor of it. So this so this peanut butter banana that you're doing, is this something that people can get if they want to drink it? Is it something that you've got available out there on the market or is it something you're working to bring? It, I'm working to bring it to the market with South Mountain Distilling, and I uh, hope to have it out by the end of 2023. Um, but it's um, and and they're they're in quite a few stores across different states, uh, and they also have an online market for it as well. Uh, so when it's ready, um, people will be able to go and uh, either buy it online or uh, you know purchase it in stores. You know, which is you know what I'm looking for. One of the things I was looking for when finding a distillery, um, South Mountain, they they have a vision like I have um, for my moonshine, and, and that's legacy. You know, they they're a huge family business. Uh, they're built on old family recipes. You know, for their uh, for their craft whiskeys, um, and it just it really spoke to me how they do business. Well, also, you can get it from me, Chris. Right here, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna end up drinking it before I get it. I'm gonna have to go to North Carolina and have and bust out the uh, I won't the, do the dining room table. I won't do that <laughs> to you. I got I I did this one. So the last thing I want to talk about. So now once it's once you've taken it off and you proof you're proofing it down. Are you adding anything at that point when you're proofing down as far as flavors? So, because you can I, I, with moonshine, yeah. you could do really whatever the fuck you want. There's you really know? no rules, right? Uh, right, right. What you're doing, um, but so when I proof it down, uh, I normally uh, get it down to about a hundred proof, and then I start, um, I start 
add the extra flavors back into it without getting into too much of the detail. But by the end, it normally gets down to about 80 proof. Um, and you got a good drinkable drink that is not heavy on the palate. Uh, and, and a good comparison to that would be Screwball. Screwball leaves that heavy, oily feeling in your mouth when you're, you know, it's a good drink. Don't get me wrong. I love Screwball. Uh, <laughs> but this is a different kind of peanut butter. Oh, definitely. Screwball is all about, I mean, so flavored bourbons aren't my favorite. You know, when you're talking about flavored whiskeys are not my f favorite. Um, a lot of them. But every once in a while, uh, for instance, one of the reasons why is because when you're dealing with a flavored whiskey and there's a lot of flavor, if you're used to drinking bourbon and you're used to drinking whiskey, it's not the same. You can't drink moonshine on the same ratio that you can with whiskey because there's a sugar delivery. And and what I found is, you know, one, the sugar delivery is is pretty much my downfall <laughs> because I will get off of the same amount of of uh, barrel proof bourbon I can drink something like uh peanut butter you know the the squirrel with squirrel or um I could drink uh I make uh I use pecans I soak them in bourbon and use the pecans for making bourbon balls but the leftover bourbon has a pecan flavoring that's a little bitter. So I'll take like Jim Beam vanilla and maybe a little Jim Beam peach and put it in there, right? And think, and then somehow think that what was left in there, the, the uh, pecan soaked up the alcohol, right? But it's the opposite. <laughs> the pecans suck up, soak up the, the water. And leave. So what's what's left in there is this higher proof, and then you add in the sugar delivery of the, and it's delicious. But one night, you know, I had probably four shots, and before you know it, I was on the ground, and 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 the next day happened, and I was wondering where did the night go, <laughs> and it wasn't that much. So sugar delivery is something that's you know people have to watch out for. Well, and I tell people when I give them a jar that it has a delay fuse on it. Like by the time, like you start questioning if it has alcohol in it, it's going to hit you at one time <laughs> and you better be sitting down uh, or laying down somewhere because it's, it's going to put you down. Yeah. There's, it's not a slow delivery. There's no doubt about it. And uh, yeah, I just find uh, that this definitely, like you said, it doesn't taste, it tastes infused, not flavored. So you get, those tastes similar to how you would when you're trying to taste a whiskey opposed to when you drink a uh, peanut butter flavored whiskey, you actually just taste peanut butter. I mean, it's so intense. It just tastes like Skippy peanut butter, or uh, I'm not a fan of rye that to have a dill taste, but uh, one of the local distilleries here make a pickle flavored bourbon. And I'm telling you, I, I don't like the dill flavor in the rye, but this is like eating a pickle. So you're having pickle whiskey that tastes like pickles. So it's like if you really love pickles, you can drink this, get drunk while you got the taste of pickles, you know. So if that's what you're looking for, it, they did a really good job of that. And it's not that yeah. bad. Now, it's for sale all around, all around here lately, but I just haven't been able to pull the trigger. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you bring up pickles because there's this guy uh, that I work with uh, that, I, you know, he's gotten some and uh, his his go to snack is peanut butter and dill pickles. I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, apparently, it's like the, what people do, but he actually drinks that with a shot of pickle juice. Uh, he says it's the best thing ever. Now, will I try that? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> but uh the peanut butter banana uh, recipe that I, I mean, well, the idea for it, you know, my wife's a huge Elvis fan. You know, peanut butter banana was his thing. Uh, me and my wife got married at Graceland. That's how I learned about Elvis and his peanut butter banana sandwiches. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of take it from a marketing standpoint that everybody loves Elvis. And if it's related to him, like, and it's, it's something he would buy, which I feel like he would. Uh, 
then, you know, other people are going to enjoy it too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's, there's no doubt. <laughs> All right. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, you got to tell us now's the time to give us, give us your social media plug. All right. Uh, so Instagram at master distiller, big Nick, uh, Facebook. I'm at uh, master distiller, big Nick Halo. Uh, so you can find me on either one of those. I'm always open to talk shop with people. Uh, you know, both places you're going to find updates as to what's going on with me, what's going on with the liquor, where I'm going to be for public appearances. Um, you know, I love meeting new people, you know, I, in my day job, I work in HR, so I'm all the time talking to people. So love talking to people. Yeah, for sure. It, it could uh, help out with sales too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're the Scotchy Bourbon Boys. Thank you for joining us, Nick. Thanks for joining, Chris. Do you have it, Chris? Do you have any last minute questions that you've been dying you, to? Ask? You know, the, the one question I want to ask um, about when he goes to sell these bottles. So, are you only going to sell the larger mason jars, or are you going to market the smaller ones? Well, I would like. I and I see this how I do. My merchandise too, because like you've seen that, you know, I had the t-shirt um, that Tiny's wearing, uh, but I also have koozies and stuff too. Uh, not, you know, we're in a time and age where not everyone can afford a twenty-five to thirty-dollar bottle of uh, alcohol. I mean, that's why you have Burnett, right? Um, but I, you know, I would like to do the minis um, yeah. and, and have those for people that want to taste it before they invest in that jar. Uh, my goal is not to be like a novelty. What you know, I bought it, I tasted it, I didn't like it, or bought it, tasted it, moving on. I want people to keep coming back for it. So yeah, I like the size of that bottle though, because the the ones the, you know, there's other marketing ones out there, but they're so small that they're literally like a shot. Where I think yeah. that is like, okay, I can drink this and enjoy it at a smaller scale, and then. I like that when I want to buy the big bottle next time or, you know, Hey, I'm going to keep that around, but I'm going to get another one. So I like that idea. Yeah. Uh, and, and that may be something for like future, future. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't really know what the plan is uh, with South mountain. You know, we're just now getting in the beginning stages of it. Uh, but you know, I, I would like to do that. So. Well, best right. of luck to you, man. It's uh, I've followed you on Facebook for a little while now. I always like to catch up on your stuff, and uh, it's awesome what you've done. And uh, you seem like a great guy, and your personality definitely is going to carry you really far. So, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, it's definitely an honor being here. You know, I think you guys are hilarious. Uh, you know, y'all definitely should have a radio radio show somewhere, uh, like on the air at FM radio. Now you, uh, it's not it's not as hilarious if you don't get to look at Jeff. You got to look at him. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what what the hell, man? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what you you're doing a whiskey there? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I I my my defenses were down on that one. So yeah. there you go. Whiskey whiskey probably texted me to told me to throw something in there. Yeah, that's probably him. <laughs> All right, so everybody. Uh, Nick Kalo, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us, Chris. And uh, we're the Scotchy Bourbon Boys, www.scotchybourbonboys.com for everything Scotchy Bourbon Boys. Check us out on all major podcast formats. And then also we are on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok uh, under the Scotchy Bourbon Boys. And if you want to follow me, Jeffrey Mueller, uh, I have my personal Facebook uh, with a lot of stuff, but pretty much if you join the Scotchy Bourbon Boys group on Facebook, you get pretty much everything that's coming up, what's happening, and you're part of the group and find out uh, when we're going to be doing barrel picks. And there's a lot of fun stuff that we do. So remember, everybody. Good moonshine, bourbon, and whiskey equals good times, good friends, and go out there and live your life dangerously. Little Steve-O's going to take us out. <laughs>
show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. Show me the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. For if we don't find the next whiskey bar, I tell you we must die. I tell you we must die. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you we must die. All right, we're off the audio portion. We're still Facebook Live and uh this is the and uh YouTube Live. This is a part where I check Facebook, see if anybody's uh if any is peanut butter oh, and I gotta turn it down. <laughs> there we go. Uh if anybody on Facebook has questions, uh now would be the time to do it. There's a couple of people watching, but I they I don't think they've been commenting. But if they do, we can watch. But uh thanks, Nick, for doing this and being a part. Uh it's kind of cool. Uh I I think uh it was uh interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. Um uh... You know, it's 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 weird, you know, doing it so privately for as long as I have and to now feel like, you know, I'm coming out of the closet in a sense for <laughs> moonshine, um, you know, and, and talking about it publicly and uh, hoping that uh, nothing bad, you know, comes from it. But um, you need to put that know, on a T-shirt. Co- coming out of the closet for moonshine. I, I come out of the closet and then have like a picture of you carrying the still. <laughs> I, I wanted to do a shirt, uh, you know, that kind of says, you know, if the police come looking for me, tell them I lost my steel in a boating accident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my family just likes corn. Leave it alone. <laughs> Our, so uh, is there a time frame when this stuff is going to be available? Um. We're, yeah, they, they've given me a time, uh, but I don't want to say it and jinx it. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident it's going to be out before the new year. So, okay. So that keeps you busy. Plus, uh, plus having a day job. (laughs) Oh yeah. And an eight month old. And a kid. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Did you, um, so do you, are you. Did you do any time from home for a while in HR or did, have you always been in the office? Uh, well, I, you know, I work for the airline with HR. So when COVID hit, uh, you know, I wasn't so sure I was going to have a job after that because all the airlines just kind of stopped. Uh, we weren't hiring. We weren't hiring for almost 12 months. Uh, and it got to the point where they were looking at what are you, you know, what, what value are you bringing to the company at this time? And I, and I thought for sure we were going to get laid off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just out of nowhere, it picked back up. And it's been uh, like floor, like heavy metal floor to the wall trying to get people back in. Yeah, that's just yeah. not that just not, that industry is really right now. Like it, and then whatever help you're supposed to be getting, you're not getting. <laughs> well, it, and I think COVID's taught a lot of people that a lot of the jobs that you were doing in the office, you can do from home. Uh, and now, like, trying to get people back into the aviation industry where you can't load bags from home, like, it's just not, you know, it's just made it so much more difficult. Or, yeah, I mean, you have to, I, I, it's just like, it's such a, I think the the airline industry it, is the people have come back to trusting it before the workers and like you, you have to have some nervousness because of the amount of volume that's there and the pressure and the cancellations. And then you've got the whole keeping the planes mechanically perfect. Like, like the industry has done for so long. Because right now, with this, I mean, there's got to be shortage of mechanics. There's oh, and pilots, shortage. flight yeah, and attendants. Yeah. 
they they let everybody retire out early. And, and like, I get it to a business point because you, you have to try to salvage where you can. Uh, so, but there's always a, a re, you know, there's always a reaction to things. And uh, by letting people retire out early, you now have a huge need for pilots that all the other airlines also need pilots. And now you're competing and trying to backstab, get pilots and flight attendants and customer service from these other airlines who are, you know, trying to warn up you as well. Well, and now you also have a perfect opportunity to sell all your little bottles to the airline. And then <laughs> everybody can be treated to a nice drink on the airline instead of some crappy stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of it like that, but yeah, I should uh, definitely try to market it to uh, oh. uh, flight service. Yeah. Yeah. That would be awesome. I mean, there you go. Talk about the ultimate legitimate. You just do it. You just basically get it, get it through all the airlines. Everybody's going to be flying everywhere. Like we need more of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'd like to, like to see your marketing campaign to convince your bosses that they should be doing your moonshine on the airlines. That would be fun. Well, it, you know, when the show aired, I was so nervous that because if you go back and watch a lot of the episodes, they talk about where people work and stuff. And, uh, you know, when they did my interview uh, for like my biopic, you know, I, I talked about where I work and, you know, I didn't really name my company per se, uh, but I was scared to death. Like my vice president was going to call me in. I was like, yeah, you know, you can't make moonshine and work for us. You know, we're going to have to let you go or yeah, except yeah, that's, then, that's except then the world completely changed, and now you can make moonshine and work for the airline because they absolutely need you. <laughs> because, <laughs> because they're having a hard enough time just keeping the people working and coming in, and you're doing it. So right there, you're you got a plus. That's the same. You know, when when my in my business, I, I I'm a manager, and all my employees every once in a while they would get you know, too much the night before show up, you know, maybe having too much in them and whatever and have to send them home. And now they've just decided that, you know, there's nobody for these, you know, for this job. <laughs> so we can just drink all day. I, I tell people that I used to turn people away if they showed up to an interview in jeans or tennis shoes. And now they're coming in in sweatpants and I don't even care. Like, you know, you, you want to do the job, you can do the job, like come work for us. Get into the, get into the filtration system. You know, I'll, I'll give you the shot. It's just, you know, I, and then there's the, I, and, and then the bar of what can get you fired has, you know, used to be at least in the middle <laughs> now yeah. it's down here. <laughs> it's like, what you did? What? Oh, oh, well, okay. Try harder next time. Please don't do that again. <laughs> it's like an all natural union. Uh, everybody knows they can get away with it. Well, I think, yeah, the world kind of does. You know, when you hire, I, I, yeah, there's no doubt. All right. So let's uh, finish up. I'm going to stop the recording. Dent Crossing, Gethsemane, Kentucky. Timeless hospitality that stirs the spirit. Dant Crossing is a one-of-a-kind destination for unforgettable weddings, memorable corporate events, day trips, and weekend getaways. The pastoral campus is anchored by Logstill Distillery and includes an amphitheater that seats 2,000, a 12-acre lake for fishing and unique lodging options, creating an immersive experience that's rooted in the community and culture of our little slice of Kentucky. More attractions will open soon at Dan Crossing, including our 21,000 square foot distillery, which we will have the ability to produce 15,000 barrels of spirit each year. A network of wooded walking trails, fully functional private train depot, farm to table restaurant, and the legacy a premier wedding and events venue. Whether you're looking to host an event, book a stay, or reserve a tasting, we're ready to welcome you. Learn more at dantcrossing.com. Calm.